Sorry about that. Success. Thank you, Steve. Um, so um, once again, this is the individual donors um, fundraising breakout room. And I'm Katie Brandon, the executive director of Pasadena Village. We are a village of 136 members. Um, we just celebrated our 10th anniversary. And um, like I showed in the previous slide, about 20, a little over 26% of our income comes from individual donors. Um, so let's, um, like I said, start this conversation rolling. You're welcome to put comments in the chat or on mute. Um, I do know it's a big group today, um, but I'll try to moderate as best I can. We have 45 people. And so let's hear about where you guys look for people um, who are strong leads in ways of cultivating donors. Susan. Oh, Susan Hamilton. I've got two Susans. Actually, could I ask people when they make their comment or give their suggestions, also indicate how much they, what their dues are. <laughs> I think this has an impact on how you fundraise and it would be nice for the rest of us to know um, sort of where we fit and what, where you fit. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Susan Alito. I like that. Okay, we'll pass it on to Susan <laughs> Hamilton. Um, I agree with Katie at, I'm with La Marinda Village in the Bay Area. We're in the East Bay. And um, we also break down our prospective donors according to segments, like she mentioned. We have a segment for members. We have a segment for volunteers. We have a segment for past donors. We have another segment for um, prospective donors. So all of our email communications are tailored and messages toward each segment. Um, our membership uh, has grown. We have 250 members. And last year, we lowered our membership um, to a dollar a day. So for a single member, it's about $300 a month. And for a um, couple membership, it's about 600 a month. And we also have, um, last year, the board was so smart. They created what's called a patron membership for members who want to pay the original, um, more expensive membership fee because they've gotten such value out of the membership. So even though their membership has been lowered, they pay the additional fee and it's, con it's considered a patron membership and a donation. It's been very successful. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. Just to clarify, what's the annual membership fee? Um, it's a dollar a day. So it's about $300 a month for a single and about $600 a month for a couple. $300 a month or a year? Oh, I'm sorry, a year, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Katie? Betty Ann. Uh, so I was gonna say, I think the hardest thing for me for the village for fundraising, it's not that hard to get money from members, but it's hard to get money from prospective members. And those are people that you know in the community have a lot of money and support a lot of other causes like the arts and whatever, <laughs> the nature, but they don't support the village. And I find it's very hard to reach beyond the boundaries of our members and past donors and volunteers. I need ideas for that. Thank you. Okay, I see CL's hand and I see a question in the chat. We're gonna to get to solicitations in a little bit. So go ahead, CL. I was just gonna comment that, um, you know, one of the, I guess one of the indicators to how people feel about your village is how often and for how long they have contributed. So I really try to look at not the amount, it's so, it's so obvious to see an amount as as that's uh, as an important indicator, but we have people who have given at a low level for a long time. And I think it's important to remember and honor them and, and let them know when you write your thank you note to them that you know they've been with you since the beginning. It may have only been for $50 a year. I have a gentleman who gives $18 a year. I think you obviously he's Jewish and that is an intentional amount, but I always recognize that he's been with us for 
the entire 11 years of our existence. And to him, that's what he get. I just, I don't ever discount by um, amount. I think longevity on the file is an important indicator and it's easy to forget that. Thank you, CL. And I so appreciate that we've talked before about how your village keeps really good track of previous donations and gifts and reminds them of that in the thank you. It's wonderful. Um, Frank. Yeah, so um, I'm with Cleveland Woodley Park Village in Washington, DC. And our dues are $300 for social membership. That's an individual or a couple. Um, and then for service receiving members, uh, it's $575 for an individual or $875 for a household, which can be up to three people, including a caregiver. Um, uh, to answer Morgan's question, we've this year tried two mailings. Um, and the, uh, the first one that we did was over the summer in June, um, and it was probably about a tenth, maybe, not, maybe it was 20% of what our end of year mailing uh, accomplishes or produces in terms of gross income. And we, of course, time the end of the year with the Giving Tuesday as well. One thing that we've tried is um, really to, um, to get membership, um, we've done direct mail uh, so we purchased a list, we segment it by age and um, make it specific to our geographic boundaries. And we send out five mailings for free concerts. Um, and, and on the back, we talk about membership, but I think it has an effect because some of those people don't come to the um, events, but then they're the same ones that get the um, direct mail from us. So it's not just always an ask, sometimes they're getting something for free. So we're trying that strategy. Stay tuned for actual results. I love that, Frank. I yeah, definitely am very aware that sometimes I feel like all we mail out is a request. And I think it's so important, even in the age of email, to mail out invitations and thank you. Hey, Frank, Frank, can I follow up this, Morgan? Um, how, what kind of, have you done an analysis of the returns on those purchase lists? We did it once, maybe five years ago, purchased a list and did not think the return was worth the cost of buying the list. Well, we buy the list once a year and it's based on voting records. So it's pretty cheap for us. It's about $400. Hmm. And we've used it, um, as I mentioned, to promote our concert series. So at each of the concert series, we have uh, each of the concerts that we have in the series, we have um, over roughly 100 people coming to those. Um, and I would say two thirds of those are not members. So they're open to the community. And I'm pretty excited that the membership numbers have grown from 130 to now um, almost to 200. So, wow. so we're, seeing, we're seeing that return on investment. Um, the reason I'm hesitating about actual numbers, Morgan, in terms of fundraising is that we'll, that, the proof will be in this year's fundraising effort, um, and which will go out in November. I'm happy to share it with you then. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Um, I know we got to start a little bit late, so let's move the conversation along. Um, our next discussion point is, as the question was in the chat, um, about sending appeals. Um, so I wanted to give us all a chance to think about um, how we request funds from our donors, from potential donors. Um, so Pasadena Village, like I said, is 136 members. Um, our, our email list has just topped over 1,000, um, but the mailing list is about 600. Um, some it's a concentric circles, whether we have people's email and mailing address. Um, and so we send appeals uh, twice a year, um, once at the very end of October and um, once in May um, before the end of our fiscal year. And so we mail to our, um, our members our, our, um, and our non-members who are in our database that are potential donors. And um, so what I wanted to share was a little bit about how Pass New Village um, sees this as an important piece um, sometimes I think the appeals, um, you're sending out a lot of them and you can see the return you get. And there's been 
some really generous donations through these appeals. Um, but I also think it's a really good reminder for, for our members and for people on our list that we are a nonprofit organization, that we uh, need community support in order to thrive and fulfill our mission. Um, so it's not just uh, the, um, the return of the funds that we um, so generously get from our donors, but it's also that reminder um, and another plug for our mission. Um, so there's been a lot of studies on the effect of appeals, you know, and stories sell more than words. Um, so we always try to profile either an individual member or what we call affinity groups, like a small group um, or some impact we've made through, usually through a volunteer on an older adult's life. Um, and it's kind of fun to think about the theme for the next appeal. Um, at Pasadena Village, we mail it out, like I said, at the end of October or sometime in May. And then we follow up with um, either a plug in our newsletter or an individual email um, to remind people. Um, and then we'll talk about more follow up actually at the next one. So let me stop there. So I wanna hear from you, like what, what do you see? I know we have a question. Let's see what was our question. How often is it best to mail solicitations from Morgan at Northwest, let's see, Northwest Neighbors? She says we do mailings once a year in November. Um, so I know that the data shows that most people donate in December during the holiday season. In fact, I was just seeing like 10% of all donations all year round are made in the last three days of December. So right before January 1st, when you all get bombarded by every nonprofit you've subscribed to throughout the year. Um, I know Giving Tuesday can be popular for some, um, some villages and for some nonprofits um, as well, but it doesn't see that same push we get at the end of the holiday season, right before the 1st of, of January. Um, we know people donate um, because they believe in the mission of the organization, often because there's a personal connection. Um, and obviously right before January 1st, there's some um, positive tax implications, although those have been changing. That is not the biggest reason people donate. Um, so let's hear about how people um, share. Oh, I'm seeing another question, but let's, let's focus on appeal letters and what works for your village. Um, what are you seeing in response? And anything creative you put in your appeals? Susan Hamilton. Um, one thing we instituted, we do one mailing a year too, and it's about 600 letters and it's expensive. So we don't do two mailings, um, but that's our, our annual push, like Katie said. And what we started doing a couple of years ago is um, I send out a list of the 600 people to the board in a Google Doc, and they choose who they know on there. They just mark it. So when we print all those letters, um, we divide up uh, the letters to the board and each board member you know, has maybe between five and 10 letters. We deliver to their houses and they write a personal note on that letter before it goes out. And that's been really successful. It's a pain and it takes a lot of time, but we've seen almost a 50% return on it when there's a personal wow. note and written by the board on the letter. Wow, that's fantastic. Yes, personalization, love it. Okay, Laura. Susan, I have a, a follow-up question. Do they write their handwritten note like a separate little on a separate little note card that you stick in the appeal letter or do they write it actually on the appeal letter? On the appeal letter. Oh. They literally just write it right on there. Just like know? a few sentences? Yeah, whatever <laughs> they like. You know, most, a lot of it is their friends. Some people are total strangers to them, but we really have found it so great and the board likes being involved you know often the boards don't like to make personal ask but you know our appeal letter has a beautiful story on it and all kinds of things that we do but just write you know we hope you'll renew or please think of us during this giving season or whatever they want to write you know whatever they're just right in the upper hand corner you know thank you that's so helpful mm -hmm. Andy, do I see your hand? Nope. No. No. <laughs> um, anybody else? Um, what works for you, Andy? Just 
since, since you called my name, um, I, I believe that the 26% is a little bit more than a quarter of the pie. And so that's pretty impressive. And of course, we always think about the base of members and how to build the membership. So it, it, it really, it, it's all about us and how we get the word out here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania about our organization, Lancaster Downtowners. And we've had in the last year, uh, we're about 240 right now. We, we, we were uh, up 40 people in the year and all people from the community who saw value in what we do. And, you know, we're all alike in so many ways, but um, this, it all begins with us. So, you know, we do special things for one another. We uh, have a silent auction once a year that raises money. We give as members and then uh, we um, buy as members and we raise $9,000 that way uh, this year. So it all begins with us. That's right, those personal relationships, that's and getting people to hear what you're saying and what you're doing, seeing what you're doing. I love it. Dick, I see your hands up. All right, Dick, we'll come back to you. I've got Susan Hamilton, but if you're able to unmute Dick, go ahead and after Susan. One more piece of that board notes on the letters. I keep track of who gives. And then in um, January and February, I send the board a list of who gave from their choices and they write a personal thank you. Wonderful, yes, yes, the thank you is my favorite part. Your favorite part, <laughs> my too. All right, I'm not, let me know if I'm missing you, your hand. And let's move on to um, donor follow-up. I'm not sharing my screen, excuse me. Noel D Durham has her hand up. Oh, well. oh, go ahead. She just disappeared. Um, I'm coming back, hold on. <laughs> okay. Sorry, um, I was gonna say we, I'm from our Arlington neighborhood village, sorry. Um, in the last three years, we've moved on to a completely online fundraising campaign and it has worked out um, pretty well for us. So we're not sending out any appeal letters um, this year. We're just gonna stick with one online fundraising campaign. Um, so it's kind of a different spin on it, but it's been pretty successful. So we're gonna continue that way. And are you seeing people click and donate? through your mm -hmm. website or PayPal, okay. Yeah, so we we set it out through MailChimp so you can all track who opens it, who clicks on it, who donates. Um, we've been able to get some match funding, which we really motivates the online campaign. So we do it for a month and we send out one email per week. And so in the middle, we'll announce a match and that will get um, people excited and, and get more donations coming in. So there are alternatives to the letter, um, appeal, but uh, both are great. Wonderful. I see Jane's hand and then Ava, I see you next, but Jane first. So I'm Penn's Village in Philadelphia. Um, we also do online fundraising. We have, and I think I may mention it last year because I was in this workshop. We we do them around non-traditional holidays. So we do Valentine's and oh. we do 4th of July. Um, <laughs> except that now some of our other nonprofits in town are doing the same thing, but at the time they didn't. Um, and we always have match. Um, and this year we actually, 4th of July had two matches. So one was for any new money coming in and the other was for um, new, well, I'm trying to remember. It, it, it also, it was an additional kind of thing. So people could give multiple, you know, depending who they were, in some cases, we got three times what they gave. Um, and we met, we met our goals. We've met our goals for the 4th of July. Every year we've done it. Um, we do not do any mailings. We have a big splashy thing on our, on our website. 
and we do multiple emails and in our newsletter. Um, so probably we're gonna keep doing that. Although we have been advised to um, do a, a, I'm not sure if we're gonna do it mailing or not, but to do something in November, reminding people they can give from their IRAs. Um, and so we're kind of pulling together what we should say about that. And actually I'd be interested if others have anything about that that they could share. I have a um, question for the for the folks who said that they do online only i mean a certain number of our members do not use uh, do not go online they don't use e email and they would never give over a website they just would they, it's not it's so foreign to them right we do mailings to people who it who don't um don't use the internet but it's it's fewer than 10. wow in our wow. Case. Yeah, and we make sure that we um, put a notice in the newsletter that gets mailed out. So there are right. other ways to find it, yeah. but it hasn't stopped us from meeting our and surpassing our goals. Great. Let, let's move on to Ava, and then Jane, I'll address your um, question about Iris. Go so ahead, Ava. We, we were successful in the spring doing a, a matching fundraising um, letter. And um, the other thing that, and so um, I was suggesting for this holiday season that we not do an appeal. And a couple of the board members were okay with it, but a couple were not. And so they have decided they want the appeal because it's, we keep going to the same well. And I'm concerned because we will solicit for a donation. And then in January, we do the membership and we've already solicited them in the spring for the special match campaign. So um, that's what's coming up. The other thing we do is thank you calls. So we try and get that after donations, after we have a campaign, we try and get the people who have donated to get phone calls. So um, yes. that's where we're at. And we Good. only solicit our members. So we oh. need to expand that because they're getting tired. So. Oh, interesting. I always think if you don't ask, they won't know you need it. That's true. Um, and we don't want to tire out your donors either. So it's always a balance. Um, well, I want to talk about IRA distributions um, and soliciting those. And also, um, I know matching gift funds have come up a couple of times. Um, so let's talk a little bit about both of those before we move on to our next discussion topic. Um, I see in the chat, Noelle says, our match this year, we have two are from a local foundation and a former board president Local businesses are always a good target. Thank you, Noel. Um, yes, so let's let's start by talking about matching gift challenges. So, if your village has never um, capitalized on a on a match, you know I think this is, it's a really easy thing to do. If you have, especially if you think of a board member or someone who's always generous with your nonprofit, um, you can leverage that gift that you know is going to come in if you ask them. You know, it's, it's some foundations and businesses and individuals really like sponsoring matches, but some people have never really thought about it. So um, one way to start is small and um, start with, like I said, a board member or an individual, you know, every year they give whatever is a large amount for your organization. Um, and you can ask them if they're willing to have their name on something or if you want it to be anonymous. And then you use that to push other donations. Um, Passing Village had a really generous matching gift challenge last year. It came to us as a match. Um, but if you don't have one, don't feel like you need to go out and um, work too hard to get one. Um, I really think that every nonprofit knows that one generous donor, it can be anonymous. And it's just up to you on how to market it and how to share it in your appeal or in your email. Um, and, and you know, put a time sensitive date on it by December 31st or by Giving Tuesday or by the end of this weekend or um, by the end of your event, if you have an annual event. Um, it just encourages people to give. If we make this goal, there's a really great free thermometer. I'll find the link and put it in the chat that you can show the progress towards the goal. Even if the goal is small, $5,000, that could be huge for your village. Um, and you know that someone's going to give it anyway. Um, this is just a way to, to, um, to share and push people to give a little bit more. Uh, matching gift challenges, like I said, it can be a really easy way to start. 
Um, it's really just about the language. And I always think borrow, don't start from scratch. Google matching gift challenge, find a nice one. NPR talks about them all the time, right? Um, you've all seen them, borrow their language, put in the numbers that you have, something nice about your mission and use it because you might as well. And you never know, you'll get, especially you'll see new donors. We also see increase in donations from your existing um, donors um, using that match to leverage, to leverage it. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions, but before we get to those, I wanted to talk about um, IRA distributions. Let me see if I can share. Um, here's the insert. And I'm happy to email this to you. If you want to email me, I'll have my email at the end of this presentation. Um, so this is an insert we put in with our appeal letter only for our members. So our appeal letter, like I said, goes out to the members and non-members. We did this just in our fall appeal. Um, we um, borrowed some of this language and refined it for Pasadena Village. Um, and really sometimes it can seem like a little overwhelming because everyone's IRAs are structured a little bit differently. Um, but everyone I've worked with, they're able to just call their representative and able to distribute the funds from their minimum distribution funds from their IRA to your nonprofit. Um, but it's up to the donor to call the IRA, um, uh, the IRA contact. And then the money needs to go straight to the nonprofit in order for them to bypass the um, tax implications. Um, so we put maybe a little too much information on here. Shorter might have been better, but we did get some new IRA distributions that we didn't get the year before. And some people said they were able to give more because of this, because it never hit their bank account. So it didn't hurt, is what I heard. <laughs> um, you know, something that they know they had to get, especially those who are um, just turning 70 and a half. Um, you know, they didn't expect that or they didn't um, budget for that IRA distribution that they have to take anyway. Um, so like I said, if you want a copy of this, borrow it at will, put it in with your appeal. We decided to just send it in with our um, with our members um, mailed appeals um, for that one. Okay, before we go on to the next one, I think I see a couple more questions. Um, going back to prospects, um, I got a DM saying, how do you prospect for donors and determine which members are able to make donations? Now, I really like this question because I think it's really important to ask even um, our members at Pasadena Village, let me back up. At Pasadena Village, we have tiered membership based on income. So an individual, it's between 120 and 680 for an individual to join. Three different tiers based on income. We ask everyone. Um, we only ask them twice a year and we get donations. And you know how much it means when you get a $10 donation from someone who's already um, giving their membership fee $10 a month. Like it means so much. It means like it's so, it tells me as executive director and our board, how much the village means to them that, you know, that they're stretching to give that amount. And for them, that $10 is more than a $5,000 check I have on my desk, right? Um, from another donor um, because they're really showing and they want to support our mission. And I think it's important to ask, obviously different boards and different people feel differently. Um, but I think it's important to send it because once again, it tells them that we're relying on, in, on individual donations as well as membership fees. And even if they can't give this year, they remember that in, in the future. Um, so um, we, we definitely segment our list based on um, what we can tell their capacity to give. We don't use a giving engine at Pasadena Village, we're too small, but I've used that as, at other nonprofits. Um, but we definitely segment gifts based on previous giving. Um, and the way we do that is pretty simple. Um, we divide it into four or five um, sections, um, depending on the previous giving. So we look at the last two years of giving. Um, and if they gave, um, say, $250 last year, then the suggested giving amounts at the bottom of their letter will start at $500. 500, um, no, it'll start at 1,000. 1,000, 500, 250. Okay, so they can give 250 again, but we're trying to push them up to 500, right? If last year they gave $100, we say 500, 250, 100. 
Um, if they gave $10, we say 10, 25, 50. Um, so we, we segment our list, um, like about five segments. And, um, and that way it, there's a suggestion and you're not asking the $10 donor for $5,000. I mean, that's just, it might happen, but they can write that in under other, right? <laughs> so, um, yes, I see some questions. Ava, do you have a question about that? Oh my goodness, I can't believe it's almost not, or nine o'clock Pacific time. Okay, um, let's run through. Um, to uh, my favorite topic, which is um, thanking our donors. Um, so let, let's talk about how we thank our donors and how often we thank our donors and how we can never thank our donors too much. <laughs> um, so does anyone have creative ways that they think of their donors? And I see Dick's hand and it might be from the previous topic. So let's start with you, Dick, and then we'll-, we'll um, Yeah, sorry about that. I missed a lot there because my, I had a computer freeze up or crash or something. I had to completely oh. reboot, so I, I missed out. One thing I wanted to say, I, I worked for child advocates in Houston for a number of years before coming out here to California. And I was on the direct mail committee there and we did a lot of direct mailing there. And what we really gained from that, we never got a lot of money from that because we got small donations. But what we did get was we got new donors that we could appeal to. And what we did then is we followed with them and over the following years, we would get a lot of money from, from people who we found through direct mail. So what we were doing was really building the database of people who were interested in what we were doing and uh, were, were appreciative of what we were doing. And we did mailings to our donors periodically, you know, to, for further appeals. And one of the most successful mail outs that we ever did was not even an appeal. We put no appeal in the letter. It was strictly a thank you letter to donors, but we included an envelope. And, and that turned out, that that netted more than any individual appeal we had for, for a couple of years. Just on that, on that one letter got more response and more money than mm -hmm. most of the appeals that we sent out. It's thanking the donors. You really have to take care of your donors and stay in touch with them and let them know that you appreciate what they're doing. Thank you, Dick. Definitely. Okay. Um, I have a question about foundation support. I was sharing, and let me share it again because um, I know we weren't recording at that point. Um, I'm going to share our income sources. So the question I see in the chat was, um, what is foundation support? Um, so for us, that's grant funding from foundations, from um, private foundations, from um, larger foundations. Um, these are usually um, solicitations we're sending out that's grant funding. Um, today, we're talking about the orange piece of the pie, individual donations. And um, you know, obviously, membership dues for us um, has shrunk. Two years ago, it was 30% of our income. Um, business partners, we have a robust business partnership program. We anticipate this piece of the pie growing a little bit this year. Um, other corporate gifts are, are in corporations and businesses that support us but aren't part of our business partner program where they get benefits based on, um, based on that program. And then we don't have an annual event, um, although this year we had an event for our 10th anniversary, so the other revenue will grow there. Um, so that was um, answering that question. Let's see if I'm not seeing your question, let me know. But let's get back to thanking our donors. So um, tell me some ways your foundation, your um, village thanks their donors throughout the, the year. Come on, does anyone pick up the phone and call their donors? Raise your hand. Anybody, board members? Okay, great. Who sends them a tax letter? Thank you. This is no gifts and services because of this. Yeah, great, great. Who sends a handwritten letter from a board member? Great, love it, love it, love it. Um, how about a publicly thanking? Thank you, donors on Facebook or in our in our um, newsletters. You say that we're so great, grateful. We made the match. Or we made our goal. Um, in your annual report, if you have an annual report, do you say thank you, donors? Like we're so glad we're you guys were part of the our mission, supporting our mission. Great. Any other ways we thank them? Go ahead, shout out, Dick. Yes. I just, yeah, I just, I hear it uh, several times and I've heard you just repeat it. I just want to emphasize again, 
that handwritten part is really important. And I heard someone mention just putting a handwritten note on a, on a printed note. If you could put some handwritten note on there that reflects a, a knowledge of that individual donor, that is extremely powerful. And back in when I was working at Child Advocates, one of the things that we did was had board members write handwritten notes, particularly to people they had some kind of contact with, but they would just write a little handwritten note. And it's that personal attention, acknowledging in a very specific way that, that, that you know that individual donor, they're not just getting a standard appeal letter, but there's something personal. And all it takes is just a phrase and a signature. Love it. Thank you, Dick. I see Emily Jones says they send personal notes to all donors of a certain threshold. An email. Thank you. That's great. Um, Elizabeth um, sent, delivers hand created flower arrangements or local honey. How sweet is that? I'm going to donate to your nonprofit. With <laughs> send it regular uh, as random thank yous during the year to larger donors. We have a quarterly newsletter just for donors giving them information about what we do with their money. There you go. That's really important. Personalize your thank you note. Look at it at least twice a year. Um, you know, put in something about what your members are doing, what, how you're spending their money. I love that. We acknowledge donors on our website, Legacy Donors, Monthly Donors, Corporate and Foundation. Fabulous. Katie, I have a question. Um, this is Elizabeth Hale from Bethesda Metro Area Village. Um, we've all been talking that, and we differentiate, like many of you, it sounds like, between donors that give different amounts. Um, but we have gone back and forth on this and are no longer listing the amount somebody gives or the level on our website. Um, if they're corporate donors, totally separate. I'm talking about individual donors. Um, since we're all a community of friends and I just wondered, I would love feedback on how many people do that, um, but it just, we stopped. It felt awkward to many of our board members and I'm wondering if there's any benefit to it. Um, thank you. I think there's a running joke in the development world that donor lists are for other development nonprofit uh, professionals to look yeah. at and, <laughs> and borrow from and know how much to ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's it's really up to what your um your village is is doing and is comfortable with i you know we've seen a trend going back and forth with appeal with um some people really like seeing their name in lights right some of our donors like seeing their name want that recognition um in the annual appeal and signage at your events things like that um but that goes back to like what we skipped a little bit and we'll get back to is this cultivation you don't know unless you ask you know if people want to see their name they're going to tell you um, as you talk with them especially your larger donors um, so you can acknowledge them in your annual report you can acknowledge donors over a certain amount or you can choose not to and like you said in a small community um, where everyone's doing their best and for someone a small donation is a huge donation for them um, we've got to be grateful to them in all different ways. Yes, Steve, I see your name. I see your hand. So to um, expound on uh, a little bit about listing uh, donor levels with donors, um, I really do think that there is a power in uh, seeing what other people have given if they're willing to do that because they may know that person. And um, again, I always think it, it, the power of giving is always people giving to people. And um, if someone can see that somebody else made a large donation, uh, you know, they might think twice about giving more to your organization simply because, um, you know, the network that uh, some of your donors give. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about donor cultivation. Um, and so, so really, this is a 12 month of the year um, job of your board, of um, your staff, if you have staff at your village. Um, you know, every message you're sending out and every meeting you're having and every event where um, the village is represented is a chance to um, share your mission and people who that mission resonates with uh, is a potential donor. Um, but I think those one-on-one -on -one conversations are the chance to really um, see what's valuable to um, an individual. 
And, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to have a lot of um, opportunities to meet with donors, um, both at Passing Village and at other nonprofits where I've worked at. Um, and just give the opportunity to let them share why they care so much about your nonprofit. Um, so if they're giving a gift that's of size to them, um, then they'll have a lot to share with you about why the village means so much to them, about why they give. Um, I think sometimes in development, it can seem a little scary to meet with a donor, but it's so wonderful to hear from someone, um, not to ask, not to make an ask, but to say, look, I want to take you out for coffee, or can we have a Zoom or a meeting, or can I talk to you on the phone? You know, this meant so much, your most recent gift, even if it was a while ago, meant so much to Pass New Village. This is what we've done. You know, can you share a little bit about why you support the village or, you know, what, why is the village important to you? Because it is their, their check, their donation is a sign of how important the mission is to them. Um, like we said before, it's not the tax write-off that's going to incentivize most people to give. It's about their, um, they really care about what you're doing. And, um, and so to sit down, to have the opportunity to sit down with a donor to take them to lunch, to take them to coffee, and to just ask them. You're gonna hear so many great things. And like I said, it doesn't need to be an ask. It doesn't need to be, um, especially not at first, hopefully. Um, your first conversation should really just be asking them, what, why, what does the village mean to you? Um, you know, because their parent was in it or their sister or they, they're a member. And you'll hear these great stories and if you do need to, if you are going to sit down and make an ask, um, always ask with another person, right? So a board member, a staff member, a board member, um, someone else who's making a donation to the village. It's really important. You don't want to ask if you haven't made a donation. And, um, and you want to go into that conversation um, prepared and that the donor is prepared. You never want to ask somebody, especially at a lunch, that out of the blue, that, I mean, that's so, that's just not going to make anyone comfortable. Um, so I, I always like to say is like, would you be willing to come and have lunch with me and our board chair so we can talk about your philanthropic commitment to Pasadena Village? Let's make it really clear what we're going to lunch about before we get to the ask. You don't want to, you know, startle them. Um, and so, that, you know, obviously it's a whole different thing. I think today we're talking a lot about appeals and how to, and individual donations through that. But I think having those relationships first is only going to make your job easier in cultivating individual donors um, for your village. And always start with the people closest to your village, your board members, your members, your volunteers. Right? Okay. We're hearing about voting list. Thank you, Frank, for sharing that information. And thank you, more information about sharing levels. Great. Okay. Um, so this, um, we, we jumped through follow-up and into thank you discussions. Um, so that, I just always like to remind people, make sure you thank your donors and you can't thank them too much. So let me get back to this. Okay, so we talked a little bit about cultivation, about putting, um, you know, every communication you're having is cultivating our donors. It's not mean you're asking each time, you're just sharing the stories of your nonprofit that's why your newsletter is such a critical piece uh, for prospective members, but also prospective donors. And at your events, you know, remind your board members, part of their job is to cultivate, right? Um, part of their job is to represent the village um, at whatever kinds of events you have. We talked about thank yous. We can never stop talking about thank yous. Thank you. um, this is a partnership we did with a local um, a local school where they made individual notes for our donors and we sent them out during volunteer appreciation week. Um, 
I just think the more times you can thank our donors, Passing Village definitely could do more. Um, but the ways we can do that, the better, because um, they're going to remember that. Okay, and that's the end of my presentation. I'm sharing my information here. Um, I really appreciate all your comments. I'll open it up for more. I'm sure you guys have more thoughts to share, but I wanted to share my contact information. Feel free to email me. Let me know how it's going for you. Um, if you want that example of the IRA, and thank you, I think the minimum age has increased since we put that out in um, this time last year. Um, so definitely check that before you share my language, but use it. You know, I feel like as, as village members, all different villages, we can do our best by just sharing what, what, what's worked well for us. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share. What comments do we have here? Um, Dick? Yeah, one of the things that donors always wanna see is impact. They wanna see what impact you're having. They're, they're interested in the mission, but they wanna see and hear stories about what you're actually accomplishing and they connect to personal stories. And I know that we're very active in doing that. We do it on our website where we have people talking about what's going on in the village so, so, so that donors can look at that and see. We send out our newsletter. And the other thing we're doing is we're getting noticed in local media. So there are stories in the media. And when people run across those stories and see us mentioned there, they get a sense of impact that way. And so that, that's something we, you got to stay in front of people all the time and let them know that you're actually doing something with the money that you need from that you get from them. Definitely. Thanks, Dick. CL? I'm curious to know how many villages, just by a show of hands, have a true legacy society or, you know, a major and plan giving program that whether or not it's named or, um, I guess that's not what's so important, but do you actively promote it? And do you um, do you have someone solely dedicated to it? So first off, do you have a legacy program? I'm seeing like four or five hands. Uh-huh. We don't have one yet at Passing Village. We're working on it. Do you have, um, for those who do, are you making regular um, solicitation calls and, and having conversations? How are you carving it? It's a, it's a challenge for our village, for me, <laughs> particularly to, to carve out the important time. And it is so important. And I think it's just um, due to the shortness of the days, <laughs> it's just a challenge to get move away from the operations and really talk long term and really have those conversations. So I, I mean, if there are some of you who are really um, you've really done, I have been successful with that. I would love to just chat with you or know who you are because I would like to follow up with you. <laughs> it looks like Frank does. Thank you, Frank. Um, Steve, yes. So, uh, see, that is, uh, that is always the problem in that you get so bogged down in day-to-day, -day, you don't have time to, uh, to work on, on endowment. We just started an endowment here in Colorado on, uh, and had a $10,000 gift to, to open it up. But we have uh, not been real successful with follow-up donations yet. Although when you ask people to give, um, oftentimes you don't know what they've done. Uh, but finding somebody who can do that, even if you have a volunteer who is, uh, who is retired, who has some experience um, and can help, we, we have a little more bandwidth um, with our organization. Uh, but we went out and talked to, and we actually interviewed um, foundations uh, who wanted to uh, get our endowment. Um, and we found a we found the Northern Colorado Foundation that was perfect for us um, because it allowed us then also to get in touch with their donors, um, and they would promote our promote our organization through their donors, which I thought was uh, extremely valuable. Yes. Um, and uh, I, you do need to preserve this after you're gone. Um, the biggest thing you can do for your organization is to leave a legacy that this is going to continue beyond your executive uh, experience or your volunteer experience. Um, and so trying to find somebody who can help you do that. One of our board members um, had a lot of experience working with the church, with his church, developing an endowment with his church. He was extremely um, helpful in providing uh, 
uh, providing um, things like that to us so that we, we really had to work hard at developing all the policies. There are a lot of policies that you have to create around donors. Um, and so you've got to have a really good infrastructure set up before you do that. But there are people out there you can get to do it. Um, when it comes to individual asking, obviously you're very crucial to go out and help make the asks. But when it comes to putting it together and, and creating that umbrella, um, look, for, look for folks that have those, um, those skills and just ask them, even if it's just a one-off to help you do it. Thank you, Steve. And, and I know Village to Village Network has a document library and I highly encourage everyone to submit at least something um, to share and make that a rich resource for all of us. You know, um, I think if we can put examples of our appeals and our newsletters and um, even these little paragraphs we put in about our legacy societies, we can all use that throughout the year um, and borrow that language. Um, so please think about that. Take a look at the documents library or talk with um, Barbara, the people at VTV. Um, because I think I think that can be just really useful. Um, Dick, you still have your hand up? You're good. I have one more suggestion. Susan, um, go ahead. Yeah, just Network for Good, you know, is a, a for-profit software system for donors, um, for <laughs> fundraising, all kinds of things. Um, but they have an amazing library of free resources and blogs and webinars, and they're really smart. So if anybody wants to check that out, I, I um, really recommend. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for sharing, for being part of this conversation, for getting our, our conference kicked off this morning. Um, and we just, I think we're just a minute over time. So what you're gonna do is click on that blue button at the bottom of your screen and click return to the main session. Um, unless you need to leave and have lunch or something. Um, it's a lot easier than um, leaving co uh, completely and having to log back in. So when you click leave room, go back to the main session and we'll see you there and excited about the conference. So grateful for all your participation. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>